Something's going to happen. Something wonderful. G'day fans and welcome to another exciting episode of Talk Nerdy to Me. Hopefully you missed us from last week and just straighten up the cameras here, get Jeffro to sit in the right spot and NPS is looking good. We've people joining us already, which is absolutely fantastic. So this is a welcome to our Facebook and YouTube viewers. Someone likes us already, there's a thumbs up. We've only been on air for like less than 20 seconds. How good is that? Uh, we've got Carol joining us from Ballarat, who's enjoying a hell of a lot more freedom than we are in Melbourne, sands, masks, and uh, self-isolation. Um, so before we get too excited about all these exciting things, I've got to introduce my lads. So uh, MPS and uh, Jeffro, how are we going tonight? Very good. Yeah, good. All right, so there we go. Right on 9 o'clock, absolutely fantastic. I hope everybody's enjoying the show. We've got 14 people watching us, which is very, very cool. So I wanted to have a bit of a chat, and as I was thinking about this uh, later on, um, uh, it's sort of like it's sort of grown a bit out of control, actually, in terms of uh, the history of this stuff. It's to do with fan films. And now, and the, what I thought was interesting is that all three of us who are presenting this have been actually heavily involved in fan films over the journey uh, in various different ways and uh, either making productions or being involved in the making of productions. Um, and I didn't discover it until I did a count, but I myself have been involved in 13 live action fan films. Can you, I th couldn't believe it, 13. And it's actually go to 15 if you include, include animated ones. So that starts from 1987 right through to 20, 2005. And, um, and it just kind of spun me out. And when I started doing a bit of research regarding fan films there was a lot more there than i'd sort of first thought of um and uh i thought it was just sort of just something i wanted to bring up and discuss from a just a historical point of view uh regarding fan films so before i get any further next is not a fan film ads next is an original <laughs> film so uh there you go um so before i kick this off and i'll just go through a very 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 quick um sort of very quick history if you will um, now, fan films have been around since like the since the sixties, actually. And in fact, Star Trek, there was actually a um, a couple of fan films made in the seventies. Uh, one was called Paragon's Paragon, uh, and of course, Oz Trek were f uh, famous for making their own uh, fan film, Sit in the Edge of the Era. And things pretty much went quiet all through the eighties. There was a couple of independent ones here and there, like V the Not So Final Battle, which you know I was involved with that. And of course, Jeffro made a couple of his fantastic ones in the nineties. Uh, mm -hmm. Ghost Bastards and Shakespeare Wars. And then, of course, the Star Wars phenomenon kicked in in the mid-90s right through to the mid-2000s. And I guess a lot of people, when they think of fan films, think of that. And then from then on, ten, a few X many years after that, Star Trek fan films kicked in, and they ended up just like blitzing the field in terms of their production quality, and it was really, really full on. And there's a whole lot of stories and stuff that go with it. So um, Ghost Bastards or Bounty Trail, oh, that's an unusual <laughs> comment. Aaron, really? That's a bizarre sort of like mix of that one. <laughs> I don't think you can compare them, but what do you guys think of when I mentioned sort of fan films that sort of um, spring to mind? So I'll start with you, MPS. Oh, look, for me, it's a bit late. I started doing fan films in like 2000, 2001. That was when I first sort of started and didn't really realise the history and the culture behind it all. So I was coming in, um, I actually came in as in the in my first fan film as the fight choreographer, which is pretty much where I met you, dude. Um mm. And for me, it was massive eyes open sort of experience, you know, building sets, teaching people how to do um, fight stuff, um, casting, all that sort of stuff. So it was all brand new, the film industry, technically. Uh, and after that, you know, I think I've, I've had my hand in about half a dozen fan films in various capacities, but all the other ones that weren't sort of Star Wars, I didn't really think that there was much um to it until you know over the years you hear star trek doctor who and and all those sort of ones doing fan films so uh for me if it wasn't through fan films believe it or not i wouldn't be sitting here talking to any of you guys because i wouldn't know any of you so there you go very good jeffro you you, you come you, jeffro comes at it from a completely different um avenue i suppose so what have you got to say anything yeah, you want to bring I mean, up yeah. I I remember sort of like there's a real stark contrast between what we were doing and then there was a sudden giant leap in technology and then what people could do. 
So, you know, I remember the stuff that I was doing, which was, you know, done on a cheap ass budget deliberately. And we also saw things like um, uh, fan films like Attack of the Killer Combags just filmed in one day where people just created a script and acted the heck out of it. Uh, so there was, you know, stuff I was doing. George Ivanov was doing um, uh, a lot of uh, his stuff like Blood Splatter and Mutilate, where we both had a, a you know, a little scene in that. He realised that's and not then, a fan film. He realised, I actually thought about that. That's actually not classed as a fan film because it's not based on a copyrighted material. So that's actually just a, a homage or a uh, a parody, actually, as, as was oh. Combat. So I thought I just, that's why that wasn't included. So, but the James Bond one was and be the James Bond one, yeah. So continue the, on. Uh, the one with the really long title. So, yep. uh, and then we had uh, Russell Devlin doing his sort of uh, stop motion work and all that. And then suddenly when technology got really good, we started seeing people using um, uh, CGI and all that. So, you know, H with his work sort of incorporated a lot of, uh, you know, sort of uh, glossy looking effects in things. And the next thing you know, we are seeing things like Bounty Trail uh, and, and such. So um, it was really a quantum jump. And I think for a lot of people, it just meant that uh, because these people were doing stuff and we had the four stop net encouraging these sort of film productions that suddenly what we were doing sort of, you know, for a couple of bucks suddenly seemed to cost a thousand bucks. Yeah, it's funny that there's a lot to cover off in different areas and you mentioned the force.net so for people out there who don't know what that is uh it's a star wars um website um your daily dose of star wars and they were really prominent in fan film hosting now this is before the youtube existed so we're talking about from the late 90s to the mid 2000s and they had their own fan film forum where all the filmmakers would go right all the star wars nerds would hang out there because they're all into filmmaking and if you made a film and it got hosted by them so in other words the force lightning would actually physically host it they would actually get the file and put on the internet and then broadcast it to everybody it was the equivalent of having a cinematic release right because it was mm -hmm. the one place that everybody went to and if you couldn't get hosting you might as well just pack up go home because you just couldn't put it anywhere you could put it on the internet but nobody would see it and so getting it hosted on the force.net was considered to be like the ultimate of achievements and it was not easy because after a while they got very selective as to who they would pick and some films just didn't make it and plenty of them did um and that was actually quite interesting. And of course, once YouTube kicked in, it all completely changed. Um, so you are right. So everybody's like mentioned Bounty Trail and uh, uh, and all the rest of it. And they were all made in the 1990s. Um, and you're right, Jeffro. Once visual effects became more prominent with um, home computers and the applications you could use in Photoshop and After Effects and all the rest of it, everything just changed practically overnight. And one of the big movies of the 1990s, um, that it didn't start the genre. But it certainly kicked it up a massive gear or two was the Dark Redemption made in Sydney, where they actually filmed yeah. it in Fox Studio, yeah. building their own sets and everything. It was really, really ahead of its time. And it got so large, it actually got, uh, they got a bit of a cease and desist from Lucasfilm, if I recall, because they were actually getting um, coverage on the current affair and all the rest of it. And some people thought it was a real movie. And, um, and it took years, it's on the internet now, you can find it, but it took years, it just, it just disappeared uh, for a long period of time. But they, um really set a standard in terms of saying well let's make the films really big and really full on now middle east you, know, you could argue that the production quality of the way they're using video cameras they weren't using film and all you could argue a whole lot of things they had the best mara jade you'll find anyway um in that particular production um and in terms of just all the costuming and all the rest but they just kicked everything up a massive gear and uh it was actually really really quite impressive um there's a whole lot of famous star wars ones in particular see between the late 90s Right to about 2005, it was the Star Wars everywhere, right? And the mm -hmm. ones that I thought of that really sort of stuck out for me that I remember. Um, so Troops came out in 1997, uh, and that a lot of people say that started the whole fan film genre. But ironically, as I remembered uh, not that long ago, Bounty Trail had a trailer made two years prior to that, and it actually got screened at Sky Force in 1996. Uh, and even though none of that footage made it to the film in 1999, that was actually prior to Troops, so you could actually argue that that trailer uh, was ahead of its time. Um, once you got into the 2000s, though, uh, there were things like in America, Night Quest uh, was a film that was actually shot on film, 16 millimeter film. I mean, like, that's how, how crazy is that? The amount of money that would have been spent just doing that, and because it had to be compressed and then put on the internet on the force slot net so it could be viewed, you could almost argue that was just ridiculous. Um, there was a movie that came out called Duality, it was uh, featuring two dudes, all green screens, all right, and they actually were so successful that Apple Macintosh actually um, 
put their film on a CD on the cover of their magazines because they use Apple Max to do all the all the digital compositing work, and so they really um, did very very well there. Um, there were, in terms of serious drama, um, Contract of Evil came out. That was a Darth Maul film. Uh, that a lot of people love because the makeup work was absolutely fantastic and that was like really, really big. In Germany, they're doing a movie called Tiderium about the story about how the Rebel Alliance steals the shuttle Tiderium for Return of the Jedi and absolutely high production qualities, completely professional cast and never got finished. It just got two trailers and that was it. It just never got done. So, um, and that was uh, actually quite disappointing. And from a completely different perspective, this was in the late 90s, uh, George Lucas in Love. That was a way of making a fan mm. film with a completely different mindset, and that was actually really, really quite good. Um, and if you know your history, and you can barely find this on um, the internet, there was a movie, a feature-length one, in made in 1992 called Quest of the Jedi in Canada. And I'll tell you what, it is – when we watched it, we wanted badges made up saying, I survived Quest of the Jedi because this is painful to sit through. Two hours, like, oh, my God, unbelievable. So – um. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, so that was when the Star Trek stuff, was, uh, Star Wars stuff was happening. And, of course, there were other films that came in after that, you know, very, very high production qualities. People realised that if you're going to make a fan film, the best thing you can do is make it as professional looking as you can using professional actors. And, uh, of course, a lot of people, it took years for people to realise that. But once they did, they end up getting a much bigger audience. And that's, of course, how it leads into the Star Trek thing. So before I move on to the next section, do either of you two want to say anything? I just had a flashback to probably the uh, earliest uh, fan film, if you want to call it that, um, Hardware Wars, because you can yeah. almost call it a fan film. Yeah, well, that actually featured in the making of Star Wars, so that was a bit of a big deal, and that's why I got such great recognition uh, back then. Uh, Ernie, for, I can't think of the guy. Fossilius, yeah. Fossilius, yeah, yeah. And that was actually, you know, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll kiss three bucks goodbye. I mean, that yeah, was absolutely fantastic. What can I he, say? Was, he was actually my inspiration for doing my fan films. So, uh, yeah, big yep. thumbs up. Uh, so, yeah, Daniel, so you're right. Imps the Relentless, sorry, it'll be within a second, Pierce. Uh, that was a sequel that was being made, uh, made, made for troops by a completely different bunch of people. And that took years and years and years for them to make that sort of stuff. But, uh, but they got there eventually and made a couple of episodes, I believe. So there you go. Uh, MPS? Yeah, Duality was one of those films that uh, was given to me and there was another couple that had massive fight scenes in it, which is what I sort of worked from to do the fight scenes in BA. So if it wasn't for that, and Duality was a brilliant film, you know, the, the whole context, you know, the two um, apprentices and, and, you know, going at it basically. The only thing that was a bit disappointing was the fact that they both had double-ended lightsabers like Maul you know, if, that, if it wasn't for that fact, it could have been more interesting. But other than that, yeah, it was pretty damn spectacular at the time. Um, as has mentioned, Desert Jewel, that was actually quite a famous one because it had no dialogue in it. It was all to do with Jawas and probe droids and all the rest of it. And um, so that finally got got finished and released, and that was actually very, very popular. For a period of time, for a very short period of time, all the best fan films in the world came from Melbourne because they're all being produced here. Now, you think of the cap, um, populations of Los Angeles and America and all the rest of it. I mean, Melbourne was like... We had, like your Broken Allegiances, your Bounty Trials, um, Desert Jewel, Sacrifices, uh, Sacrifice, rather, um, and there's one other just got slipped in mind. Um, Wrath of and the Mandalorian. Were Melbourne, hey? Wrath of the Mandalorian. Oh, that came a couple of years later. But, yeah, you could argue that for a period of time, um, yeah, Melbourne was like a centre point of producing the best quality movies, even like even if you do include things like Jedi Heritage and whatever else, and Cold Patrol. So you start rattling them off, and they were all made in Melbourne. So they weren't made in different parts of California. They were made in the one city. So that alone is actually quite impressive. Um, and uh, you are right, Aaron. There would be a lot of fan films that were made in the 80s that don't exist any longer. Um, and, of course, we're talking about how things change. And I know Colin has made a reference here to uh, Axanar, and I'm going to bring that up in a few minutes. But uh, you're right. What started as a backyard thing, and, of course, with the Star Wars guys, it was like, okay, we can now do lightsaber special effects with After Effects, so let's get in the backyard. You're a Sith. I'm a Jedi. Let's whack the crap out of each other. Bang, we've got a fan film, right? And for a period of time, that was actually very, very popular, and a lot of people mm -hmm. loved it. But then people realised, hey, we can actually do real serious stuff with this. We can actually get professional cameras, professional crews, bigger budgets. And then, of course, before you knew it, the productions just got completely out of hand and they became really, really quite large and complicated. And then, of course, you've got the question of, like, well, how big is too big? And that's where a lot of the Star Trek stuff comes into it, which um, I'm going to mention uh, in a tick. So uh, so Star Trek. So you had all the Star Wars guys doing their thing, but then Star Trek uh, teams come into it. 
and they end up doing something completely different. Most of their stuff is primarily set in the original series, and they went out building entire sets, right, entire uh, corridors and entire, uh, what do you call it, bridges of the Enterprise or these other starships, and it was like really, really full-on stuff. And it got to the point where they were actually getting actors and crew members from the original shows, from the actual shows, working on these productions. Now, that's a big deal where you're saying, oh, we're just fans making this as a bit of fun, and the actual actors and that are coming on board to, to help out. And um, uh, the one of the ones that sort of uh, springs to mind is um, Star Trek of Gods and Men, which was actually a fan film created by Tim Russ, who plays Tuvok in um, Voyager. And it's like, so actually actors are then producing fan films of a show or of a series that they're actually working in. It's like, how? what a spin-out that is. Um and then came along New Voyages, which was also known as Star Trek Phase 2, where the main guy who created it, believe it or not, was an Elvis impersonator, and they ended up building uh, the bridge set of the Enterprise, which eventually got used, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in in a mirror darkly in Enterprise uh, when they needed to flash back into um, uh, the original series Enterprise and they needed a set, and it's like, hey, this, these guys already built one, so I'll just use that. And, I mean, how amazing that is. So... They actually produced a lot of episodes, but they had to stop when the Paramount ruling came through, which stopped Star Trek fan films from being produced in a certain way. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then, of course, oh, sorry, Star Trek continues. They're the ones who had the set. So, um, so yeah, uh, that was uh, used in, in A Mirror Darkly. So, so the Star Trek fan films, they took these things into places that Star Wars guys just never did. And, um, you know, the only thing that, I mean, you know, we all know uh, Russell Devlin, as you mentioned earlier, Jeff Rowe, and he said sometimes the only thing that let these shows down is that they look fantastic. They had all the production quality, clearly had the passion, but what they didn't always have was the acting quality. And one of the hardest things you can do when you're making a fan film is acknowledge that, hey, I can't act. I'll bring in professionals to do it for me. And that and that's how you get to much better quality from your production. So there you go. Uh, and then, of course, that all led into Prelude to Axanar, which is a whole saga into itself. Now, before I move on to the next bit, do either you two want to sort of add in anything? Yeah, I just want to say that a lot of the um, Star Wars fan films sort of lost me a little bit because it always seemed like to be an excuse to either go out into a forest and uh, having a really extended lightsaber battle. So it's like, where's the plot? Oh, well, we don't need a plot because lightsaber battles are cool. So that's sort of one thing I remember sort of like being a little bit disappointed about. Uh, because people just seem to think that that's all they needed to do to make a successful uh, Star Wars fan film. NPS, anything you want to add? No, not really. I, I kind of agree with Jeff Rowe, but at the same time, uh, the fight scenes are not that hard to do. Um, two sticks getting whacked together. You just have to make sure you don't kill each other, basically. Um, but in terms of putting it into a story, that's a lot more difficult. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, Aaron's brought up the thing. Yeah, right, Aaron. They are they do fall into two categories. One that's made over a weekend and cheap and nasty and is a bit of fun, and you got the ones that have the really professional budgets. And then, of course, that brings me into um, some of the stuff that was made in the mid two thousands. So, one of the first ones that sort of came out. Well, it's not one. I shouldn't say one of the first, but one of the ones that made such a huge impact was Batman Dead End, made by a guy mm. called. Yeah. Right, with a thirty thousand dollar production budget, and it just like blew people away. I mean, people just fans just went completely bananas over this thing. And of course, this was done as a show reel for the guy who made it, as it, so he could get you know to show how he could be, um, uh, how he could direct films. And ironically, he ended up getting a proper gig out of it. Uh, and it had six hundred thousand downloads in the first week. And as you can imagine, it just set the world on fire. I mean, I've got a copy of it. I'm sure MPS does too. It's absolutely yeah. fantastic. And um, but I mean, thirty thousand bucks is a lot of money to pour into a film with the hope that it actually gets you some uh, work later on. And clearly that is not going to compete against two dudes just whacking the crap out of each other with the sticks in the, in the backyard. So, yeah, you are right, uh, Aaron. There's definitely a huge difference between how these things are put together. And, of course, from there, uh, Sandy Clora went on to do World's Finest, which was the Batman-Superman thing. Now, it was done as a trailer for a film that didn't exist, but it looked so good, people thought it was a real movie. I don't know if you remember seeing it. I actually saw it. The day before I started directing the first shoot of Jota Heritage, and I'll tell you what, it absolutely depressed me like no end because it looked fantastic. And it looked 100% real because mm. it actually had the Warner Brothers thing at the start and everything, and people just said, oh, my God, that's absolutely magnificent. So and so that was another big one that came out. Um, and then there was another one, and this one I didn't actually read, know about until today. So there's a trailer film. Now, the thing about making fan films like trailers is they don't have to have a story. They just need to have a premise 
and a shitload of really good shots. And it was called Grayson. Okay. Yes. Brilliant yeah. thing. Now the guy who made that shot it on film, and they spent it over months and months and months because they can only because the cost of processing the film it took so long to do. But the concept of saying, oh, okay, well, Dick Grayson uh, lives. Batman got killed off. Let's try and find out who killed him. And it was just a whole lot of really, really cool shots. It looked absolutely fantastic. And apparently it cost 18 grand to make. And this is back in 2005 or whatever. And apparently uh, it was so successful of being screened at your Comic Cons in America that um, Hero Fan Films were banned from the 2004 Comic Con because Grayson was so successful. It was actually taking um, the audience away from the real licensed productions i didn't know that actually i wasn't aware if either you two knew that or not so but uh yeah um but there's a making of documentary for grayson absolutely spectacular so uh, i mean that was something i looked at and I go you know what and it was all done guerrilla style you know there's no permission for anything they just went out and did it and then just put it all together and i tell you what it was, yeah that was definitely that set a very very high benchmark um ads has mentioned ryan versus dorkman yeah that was an interesting one because you could argue as to whether it's a film or not, because there's no story. All it is is a lightsaber fight scene between two dudes, uh, but it's a very, very advanced one, very, very well done one. But just they're two guys. There's no costumes involved. They're just inside this industrial estate, and they're just whacking the crap out of each other. But it's the choreography that makes it really, really impressive. Uh, so there you go. And I like that, Catherine. Our third category, Never Finished. Yeah, well, one of the films that I directed was Never Finished, so uh, I know all about that one. So uh, there you go. Very, very cool. In terms of Batman, Dead End, Grayson, and World's Finest, they were they were spectacular. They were just like you said, the production qualities were amazing. Regardless of how much they spent on them, they were probably the closest thing. In actual fact, I'd rather see those films than watch Justice League or Batman vs Superman because they are just so much better in how they were written uh, and the concept. You know, Batman, Dead End. For those who haven't seen it. Is Batman's chasing the Joker, and then the next thing you know, Predator turns up. Yeah. You know, and you go, "Well, hang on a second, what the hell's going on here?" Batman starts fighting off what ends up being what is it, three Predators, and uh, just towards the end, an alien turns up, and you go, yeah. "Oh, now it's going to get interesting." Um, oh, go on. I was going to say, and Grayson was just brilliant. Um, a world without Batman, and him and Barbara Gordon get together, so Batman. Batgirl and Robin get together uh, and he's on a mission as bad as Batman was when he first became Batman. So, yeah, really good stuff. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. And they came out at the right time too because the world was hungry for this sort of material and, and it just set the world on fire. Um, it's very funny you should mention that World's Finest and Dead End were, say, better than, say, actual films that were made and that'll actually hook back into the issue that Axanar had that um, I'll get to you in a moment. But sometimes... With fan films, things don't always go the way you want them to. There are some licenses that you are not allowed to make fan films for, okay? Now, I think there was a Spanish production who wanted to do their own version of Dune. They went to the trouble of pre-production, making all the costumes, spending a fair bit of money and time on it, effort on it. Then they went to the Herbert Estate to say, can we actually make this? And the Herbert Estate said no, right? And just shut them down, just like that, done, right? And it's like, but they'd already started. They hadn't filmed anything, but they were sort of like well into pre-production. And I think it also happened with a Warhammer 40K film where um, they were going to do these productions, they went to Games Workshop and Games Workshop said, no, you can't do it. Now, I don't know if in both cases they were going to try and make profit or money out of these productions because that is just like not allowed, right? You cannot make money off a licensed product. That's the definition of what a fan film is as versus, versus a homage or a licensed product. So that's the key thing. Now, with Lord of the Rings, to the best of my knowledge, they're not allowed either, but I think one slipped through. Um, it was a Gollum story, if I recall, and I think they allowed it because it was so well made. But I haven't, I, I can't remember, it was like 10 years ago, it was something like that when I first saw this thing. And I thought, that's yeah, actually quite impressive. But to the best of my knowledge, Lord of the Rings aren't allowed. And Aaron mentioned about Harry Potter. I was wondering about Harry Potter. I thought I'm be amazed if Harry Potter films are allowed or whether they're just the, the licensees say, no, you can't do it. So I'm not too sure what the story is with that. So, um, there you go. Predator versus Pokemon. you got to kill them all. I like that one. So um, <laughs> there you go. Was, um, was, sorry, go on. Go for I was going to say, there's also a Serenity film or a Firefly film that was being made. I don't think it ever got finished. Uh, they uh, built a, a one scale of of the of the Serenity, and that was about it, really. That's all I heard. I can tell you all about that one. Um, so it was actually called Bellflower, uh, and 
It was going to be um, produced in 2005. And I remember this because I got to visit the set. It was being made in Melbourne. And the guy who was making the film uh, had actually built his own version of, uh, of, of a Firefly type ship. Not the entire thing, but, you know, the cockpit and the sleeping quarters and whatever else. And he had a whole group of people and they're all as passionate as anything about getting this thing done. Uh, the problem was they had no experience. They didn't really know what they were doing. And the guy who was making it wanted to be the actor in it and he couldn't act for peanuts, right? And um, even when I was there visiting the guys and they had a little handy cam and I thought, mate, you, know, you can't use that. You've got to use a proper camera if you're going to spend this much time building this set. Anyway, it took years. So this is 2005, right? There were at least four parts of it uh, that came out uh, and the first one didn't come out until 2013. So it was like eight years later. So uh, and by then the whole Firefly thing has long since sort of moved on. And I remember seeing the first episode, and it was just very, very disappointing. Sure, you got a fantastic visual effects, but anybody can do visual effects these days. You speak to the right people. But the way the acting was deplor deplorable, the story was very, very weak. And, of course, now it's 2020. It's almost like a, a forgotten thing. So they had their opportunity to cash in on – uh, something that was really, really popular at the time in 2005 uh, with a set that they'd actually built and everything, and it just it all fell through. So you can find it on YouTube. It's called Bowflower, so uh, be sure to check it out if you're a, a fan of um, uh, Firefly. Um, so this sort of brings us into the whole Axanar thing. So I was doing a bit of reading about Prelude to Axanar, and um, I think that the biggest problem you've got is if you're going to do a fan film, and your audience starts saying, oh, it's better than the real thing, that's clearly going to put a lot of producers' noses out of, out of joint because it's meant to be done as a bit of fun, a bit of like, oh, we love the product, we're passionate about the product, so therefore we'll make something that honours the product. But when the audience is saying, oh, it's better than the actual product, uh, as it was heading down the path with Axanar, with all the people pouring all this money into it, you can tell, see that this is going to make a few people upset uh, in in the, those the bean counters because the last thing you want is for an audience out there, but it's people out there in the world who think that your the product that you're making as a fan film is the real thing, okay? And that's where I think it got, the lines got blurred. There's a whole lot of other issues, but I think that was definitely one of the key things uh, because in the end, a fan film can only go so far before it becomes too professional, too uh, too big. And I think that's what happened with uh, Axar because they're going to do a feature film. They had all these people pour all this money into it. And it was like, um, guys, you're kind of overstepping the line a little bit here. It's meant to be a small thing only. You're not meant to be competing against the real productions. And I think at the time, uh, I can't remember if it was Into Darkness or Beyond was sort of in the works. So I can understand that that would have upset a lot of Apple carts. So um, uh, there you go. Um uh, anything you want? Anything you two want to add in? Well, I can read some comments. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not surprised that um, fans can't make a, a June movie. You want to know why? Why? Because it gets sandbagged every time. Good on you. Yeah. I've been waiting. I've been waiting ten minutes <laughs> to say that. <laughs> oh my god. Um. So, uh, Aaron, uh, Chad made it. Yeah. I mean, fan films are meant to be by default fun, easygoing things. I mean, you remember like those kids who did the Raiders of the Lost Ark remake? Mm. They did a shot-for-shot -shot remake of the original movie. It took them like 15 years and the kids all grew up as they were going through it, but they actually did it. And I think it was Steven Spielberg uh, made a comment about it as well and it became a bit of a famous thing. It took them so long, they just shot-for-shot -shot remake of the actual movie. But there is definitely a line to be crossed when you start getting too professional um, and, uh, and when the budgets get too big. Now, I've always argued, right, that if you're going to pour all this money into a film, why don't you just make an original movie? That way you can sell it, right? You can you can actually make money off it. Why would you spend 30, 40, 50 grand uh, on a fan film? It makes no sense. You can't sell it, right? At the very least, um, it'll just get out there and then it'll just get forgotten. And there's certainly some productions that are very, very big and popular at the moment. But you've got to wonder how far is too far. At least with Sandy, he had... A goal in mind. That's the reason why he did Batman Dead End. He wanted to become, get into the industry and it worked. But for a lot of people, it's just a bit of fun and, and, and giggles and you kind of wonder what the, the methodology or the mindset is behind it. So there you go. Very, very cool. Um, now, now yep. here's, a, here's a fan film genre that you probably didn't realise. Uh, you might have, dude, but uh, Matrix. I was involved in a Matrix oh, yeah. fan film back, oh, yeah. oh, mm. what was it, 15 years ago. Um but yeah, at the time when they were doing the Matrix films up in Sydney, uh, a 10 disc box set came out apparently, uh, and they were going to add uh, a bunch of fan films into it. And the one that I was involved in didn't quite make it in there. So that would have been very cool to get it into this 10 disc box set. Um, yeah, so close, but not 
so far away, really. Yeah, because um, with YouTube, there's a lot of stuff that's out there now, and I don't know if there's still a market for it. I mean, when I was talking about earlier about the Star Wars stuff and, and the Force.net, at least there was a concentrated market. You just go there, you find out everything. But now if you produce something and stick it on YouTube, you then got to find a way to tell everybody that it exists. And I'm, I don't know if that still happens. I mean, there are a lot of movies that come and go, and um, I don't know if you guys sort of keep up on top of what's coming out from a fan film perspective, but I sort of wonder if there's still a need for them anymore um, because... Um, you got to wonder, it's like, what's what's the motivation for doing it? Because back in the day, it was for the fun of it, and it was a challenge. But now everything's relatively easy when you sort of sit yeah. and think about it. And of course, if you don't, sorry, we were the sec, Jeffro. If you don't make it really high quality and professional, you won't get an audience straight away. People are going to look at it and go, "No, nah, that's all cheap and nasty." We're past that now, right? And we can remember from a uh, fan film festival back in four, three, four. Um, uh, back in was it Force Yeah, it was back in two thousand and five. You know, people want the biggest and the best now, and you just can't do them on the cheap anymore. And I think that's just eliminated half the market. Sorry, Jeff, I go for a minute. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the stuff these days, it always just seems to be people splicing together clips. So, uh, I mean, it's gone to the point where people have spliced clips so well they'll create a fake trailer, and for a lot of people, it actually looks like a real trailer for a movie. So I think, you know, the days of acting in front of a camera and doing your own props and, and, and stuff like that sort of has gone by the wayside and people are just using sort of existing footage and just putting it all together. And, and I guess like music, they're sort of doing a, a mashup of uh, things to create something new. Yeah, I agree with it. As I said, it still happens. YouTube has made it. And I agree with you. You make a film, you stick it on YouTube, fantastic, but it's still got to find an audience for it. And I would argue, especially in the Star Wars realm, it's not the same as it was back in the mid 2000s. Okay, um, when you made a fan film and it was a good one, everybody just took notice. Whereas now, I think there's so much time has passed, so much has happened that um, people don't start. Even the really, really high end ones, people just don't um, appreciate them or absorb them as once. I mean, we're talking about movies like here tonight, made 20 years ago, right? But I can't tell you what was made last week. I've got no idea. So even from my point of view, I've sort of gone past it also. But I could be just the exception. Uh, MPS. Um, I saw one a couple of weeks ago. It was a Batman one, and, yeah, slightly forgettable, but at the same time it wasn't. I think the fan film genre in general uh, is for new filmmakers more than anything else. You know, they want to try it out, see if it works. They want to make a film that, for some of them, uh, it's their chance to, you know, like Batman Dead End, show what they can do for bigger, better things. And some of the people that we know have gotten through and done bigger, better things, uh, and some haven't. So, um, you know, and that's just in the commas Hollywood uh, at its best, basically, you know, some make it, some don't. I know I've seen professional films that have had cinematic releases that are terrible. Mm. These fan films that we're talking about outdo them by truckloads. So, yeah, I think nowadays anyone who's doing a fan film, unless it's on a very professional level for Hollywood to notice, it's for a new filmmaker type of uh, person. Yeah, I yeah, know what you're talking about, Suicide Squad. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. Well, you know, there has been comments like Rogue One. You know, somebody once said that Rogue One was the most expensive uh, fan film ever made, and maybe you can argue that. Uh, I know with the Star Trek stuff, after Axanar, um, yeah, they got uh, Star Trek fan films have been like reeled right in now. They can only be 15 minutes long and you can't use um, talent who have actually worked on the actual productions. And, of course, that's funny because the guy, the I forgot his name, hang on, um, the James Crawley guy can't actually work on his own fan film creation because he actually worked. He actually appeared in Star Trek, um, the TV series, um, uh, one of the movies, as an extra. So he actually can't even appear or work on his own production anymore based on those rules. So so in the end, the Axanar thing was a good example where they got, took it so far that they got all the, uh, it just got chopped off and it's impacted everything else that's came after it. And they've got productions uh, that haven't been, episodes that haven't been, been finished and they can't finish them now. So uh, there's a lesson to be learned from that, that's for sure, about saying, okay, how big is too big? And when should you say, okay, we're getting, um, uh, we overstepping the boundaries here as to what's allowed and what's not. So uh, there you go. <laughs> Very interesting stuff. Go on. What? Crystal Skull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Said it. 
<laughs> yeah, very good. But I think it's very funny because I was thinking about this last night and I'm thinking what are the better films that I've worked on? And I could honestly say that when we were doing Ghost Passes back in 1992, right, I mean, it was just shits and giggles, right? There was just mm. mucking around with a video camera out in the streets. There's no pressure. There's no tension. There's no stress. It's just for laughs, right? And that's mm. all it is. And it was meant to be for the fun of it. Right. Whereas I've worked on other films where it's is tense and it's stress and there's a lot of money being poured into it. And you kind of think, okay, is is the reason for doing it just being missed completely? I mean, what are you trying to say? You're trying to say we're so good that we actually can compete with the real thing? Or um uh, or I don't know. So I could argue that uh yes, the the mindset of doing very large, elaborate productions is sort of a going against uh what the uh, idea was in the first place. But having said that. As we saw with the Star Trek ones, hey, if you can build your own sets and make a replica of the show that you love that no longer exists, then I suppose that's probably not a bad thing. So uh, there you go. Very good stuff. Anything else you want to add in before we uh, finish up, lads? No, that uh, was very well said. Uh, that was uh, lots of good examples, and I think people should be making a little list and sort of uh, hunting them down and see if they can find some of those examples on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of lot lot of films out there, small, big, and uh, whatever else. MPS. I only have one more thing to say, dude. I got this what? idea for a fan film. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, God. I think I definitely do think the glory days of making fan films is past. That's for sure. So, um, and for those who were around them in the first half of the two thousands. It was fantastic. Everybody was really into it, and it was just it was a great time to be creative. And uh, yeah, and we're all doing it for the right reasons too, for the love of the genre. So have mm. good. Yeah. All right. So uh, with that in mind, we're going to buzz off. We will see you all uh, next week. Uh, make sure you stay self isolating. Keep your masks on when you go outside, and all the rest of it. And in the interim, all we can say is <gasps> stay nerdy. Stay nerdy. Uh -huh.